Okay, we're back again, and we're going to take a look at multinomial logistic regression. So um, multinomial logistic regression is going to be our very first introduction into um, how to build neural networks. And if you remember, this is just one flat layer of perceptrons, of neurons. And what they're going to be doing is they're going to be predicting um, the probability if of each a digit in MNIST being um, a 0 or a 1 or a 2 or a 3, so on, all the way to 9. Um, and we're going to get an output, which is a, pre a confidence prediction of um, which class an observation in our set belongs to. Okay, so that's, that's how it works. I've showed you MNIST. Um, for uh, this particular implementation of... Um, neural net, I'm going to be using TensorFlow, which is a brand new Google tool. And um, there's lots of different um, packages out there that you can use to implement neural networks in. Theano is a great one. Keras, that runs on top of Theano, um, is fantastic, and it can actually use TensorFlow as well. Um, so can, there's another high-level API called sklearn. Um, there's this thing called Torch, um, definitely worth looking into as well. And then, of course, my friends in Berkeley uh, have created a fantastic library in CAFE and DCAF, um, both great neural network t um, tools as well. That said, today I'm going to be using Google TensorFlow because it's the new cool thing, and I'm all about new and cool. Okay, so um, we're going to import TensorFlow, and we're going to get MNIST all set up again. So here is where I'm going to be building my multinomial logistic regression. And if you need an overview again of multinomial logistic, refer back to my first video uh, where I show you what that is. Okay. Um, so TensorFlow is um, a little bit more complicated than the sklearn stuff that we've been using. Um, Scikit makes it pretty easy to, to do machine learning, and, and we get a little bit spoiled. Uh, that said, in... Um, in TensorFlow, we have all the tools we need, but we're going to have to wire things a little bit more manually. And let me show you how that works. TensorFlow is all about um, building a graph, and in that graph, what happens is tensors, um, which I'll explain in a second, flow between nodes in the graph. Okay, and what a tensor is, is it's an abstraction of a matrix. So a tensor is a matrix, but it's probably more than two dimensions. It's often the case it's three dimensions or four dimensions. Um, all of TensorFlow is implemented in C++, and that's important because you're going to notice that all of a sudden we no longer have the duct typing that we've grown really familiar with and fond of in Python. Now we have to explicitly type our, um, our variables, and I'm going to show you that too. Okay, let's walk through this code. There's basically two chunks to it. Chunk one defines the graph that we're going to um, use to run our multinomial logistic regression. And then part two is the training stuff that we use to train the graph. All right, so here we go. All right, so the first thing that we need in TensorFlow is we need these placeholders. And placeholders, what they are is um, they're, an, this is the input that's going to come from our training routine, and it's going to come in um, and need to fill the spot of this placeholder. So we're going to feed data in with our training routine, and it's going to, and the data will go into uh, TF training data set and TF train labels. And uh, what, the, what these are going to be is they're going to be um, Image size by image size, so 28 by 28, that gives us 784, which is the um, which is the array that we've seen in MNIST, right? And then batch size. I'm going to explain this in a second, but we're not going to be running all of the images uh, through multinomial logistic at once. What we're going to do is we're going to take a random chunk of images, and we're going to show the network that random chunk. It turns out that by using small random chunks, we can train much, much faster. And um, I'll, I'll talk about that more in a second. All right. So now if you remember the, the uh, math, the, what we were going to do was we were going to have a weight matrix times our x variables plus a b term, right? Um, a bias. And so what you can see here is I'm initializing the uh, w matrix, and I'm initializing 
the B matrix. That's right, I'm having to build this from scratch. It's much more difficult now. So, and then I built this model, and what my model returns is a TensorFlow matrix multiplication of data, which in the training step will be the training data set, multiplied by W underscore logit, which is the weight um, matrix, and then I'm going to add the bias matrix. So this is, in one line, the um, multivariate function of the uh, multilayer perceptron. So and if you notice, um, this is going to be basically 10 deep, one for each, uh, one for each output. Okay, so then I'm going to continue to add on to this. I'm going to I'm going to actually use this down here. So logits is going to be the multinomial logistic output layer, and it's defined by model run on the training data set, which is that placeholder I had previously defined. So that's going to give you a logistic output. All right, but then we have to figure out how right we were. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a loss function. And the loss function I'm using here is going to compare the training labels, so this is truth, against the prediction. And we're going to use this function called softmax cross entropy to uh, measure the difference between them. Now you can look that up if you'd like, but um, this thing called cross entropy is the most common way to measure loss. It's, so it's an error function. It's like root mean squared error or R squared or some of those other th others that you've used to measure the accuracy of your linear regressions. <clears throat> All right, now one step further, I'm gonna compute here the um, regularization parameter for the logistic layer. So this is, do you remember um, logistic regression with, or linear regression with regularization? I'm doing the same thing here. I'm adding regularization terms in. And the way I do that is I compute this regularization loss, and then I multiply that times beta, which is a regularization constant, a hyperparameter that I can increase or decrease. I add that to the total loss, or to add that to the loss defined up here, the cross entropy loss, and I get total loss. And this is a regularized loss. Okay, so now I know I've defined my function. I've created a loss function. So then the last thing I need to do is optimize. I have to I have to adjust the model weights so that they're correct. And I use I to do that I use gradient descent. Now before in linear regression we had to hand implement gradient descent. And that was a lot of hard work. Luckily, we don't have to go that far here. What we can do is we can call TensorFlow's gradient descent optimizer and give it a learning rate and say we want to minimize the value total loss. And that's going to be our optimizer. And then at the very last thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a couple of functions called train prediction. And what train prediction does is if we evaluate that, it's going to um, evaluate the <clears throat> the value for uh, logits, right, which is going to be the um, training data. And then validation prediction is going to be the same thing, except we're going to run the model on the validation data set. And then test is going to be the same thing, but run on the test data set. One last thing, I'm going to have this little accuracy helper function. This is going to, you can read this later, but this is going to help me understand how accurate something is. Okay, I know that was a lot. Feel free to stop the video, look at the code, take it apart, put it back together again, do whatever you want. Um, there's not going to be a lot of homework this week anyway that's involving implementing TensorFlow because this is pretty advanced stuff. That said, it'd be good for you to understand. Okay, let's look at how we would train this graph that we created up here. And just to review, the graph is placeholders, then the model, a loss function, and an optimization step. All right, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to instantiate this graph, which, by the way, this is going to run on my GPU, which is pretty cool. Um, we're going to initialize all the variables, <coughs> and we're going to run for 5,000 steps. And then what we're going to do is we're going to generate mini batches, and mini batches are um, random small chunks of data. 
And now we're going to use this instead of the entire batch because it turns out that these that these small um, that these small gradients they're they're often not the right way, um, but they're much faster to compute. It's much faster to compute. Um, for in this case, I'm going to use a, a mini batch of 120. It's much faster to compute the gradient um, using 128 examples than it is using the entire data set, all 55,000. Um, it doesn't, it's not as good, right? It doesn't give us the, the correct path down the hill quite as accurately. So what we do is we just run for more steps, and that actually ends up being a net win. So in that process of using small batches of your entire training set, that's called stochastic gradient descent. In stochastic gradient descent, it works so well, it's considered black magic by the, by the machine learning community. It works really well. So what we're going to do is we're going to create this mini batch, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to put it into this dictionary, and it's called a feed dict. And what the feed dict does is it takes the training set and the labels and any other parameters you want to throw to the graph, and um, every every step it'll feed a new one. So every time we call this, we'll get a new chunk of data, and we'll put it in the dictionary, and then we'll send it off to the gra the graph to run. And then what we're going to do is at every 500 steps we're going to look at our loss function. So this is the cross entropy function. And now if things are going well, we should see that this, this decreases. We're going to also look at the accuracy of the test set against the test set, which should be good. And then we're going to look at the validation set um, versus the true labels. Now, this is probably going to be less good, but we hopefully can see it increase over time. The very last thing we're going to look at is after the model is done training, then we'll expose it to our test set. All right, let's try it out. Here we go. We've initialized. Our mini batch loss is at 11. Oh, and look, next step, it's down to 0.5. Our accuracy is increasing. Our accuracy was 9.4%, now it's 89%. This should just take a few minutes. And we'll keep watching it, but we can see that our accuracy continues to improve. Our network is learning, and this is exciting. The loss function is occasionally fluctuating, but it tends to be decreasing. This is all good. At the very end, our mini-batch accuracy hit 93%. Our validation accuracy went 92.1%, and our test accuracy was 92%. So the difference between these two tells me that our network has overfit very little. And we're at 92% accuracy on a 10-class classification pro problem understanding handwritten digits. That's pretty amazingly good. But you know what? In the terms of... Um, this problem and deep learning, it's actually not all that good. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to improve on this. So this was multinomial logistics, so keep in mind this is 10 perceptrons lined up in a row. Next, we're going to move on to a multi-layer perceptron, so we're going to introduce hidden layers, and let's see what that does.